Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian Tsunami. Tonight we will start with Chapter 22, Hydrometeorological Disasters in the Day and Age of Climate Change understanding El Nino induced natural calamity. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading sessions before we start. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security has also evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal health care, sustainable development goals. These are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Tonight we will start with the chapter on hydrometeorological disasters and in the day and age of climate change. Hydrometeorological disasters are by definition weather induced calamities where precipitation is the determining factor. These water related calamities broadly include avalanches, earth, cloud bursts, coastal incursions, cyclones, climate change, droughts, desertification, El Nino, southern oscillation, epidemics construed as an after effect of climate flood, flash floods, famine, the result of drought, forest fires, fog, hailstorm, landslide, mudslide, sandstorm, sea surge, storm, falls, thunderstorm, tsunami, which is a geological calamity and urban flood. I think this is an exhaustive list of hydrometeorological disasters, said Dr. B. N. Goswami, former director and professor emeritus of the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune. He told me this in an exclusive interview. Indeed, the scope of study only on hydrometeorological disasters calls for immense unwavering and focused attention and cannot be included in a broader work on disaster management. Climate change alone is so vast in scope that even globally researched studies are difficult to compress into one comprehensive chapter with anecdotes. Environmental factors include, sorry, environmental factors inducing tsunami are icebergs melting in the polar regions or mountainous glaciers heaving towards the ocean from say Alaska or the Arctic regions or polar regions. The Bayonne Valley tsunami in Alaska in 1958 remains the largest tsunami on record not the Asian tsunami as many. Secondly, instead of putting in text a comprehensive study of various types of hydrometeorological disasters, it serves well to stimulate our comprehension through various allied intellectual exercises to expand our horizon of understanding earth sciences and hydrometeorological disasters. Thus, the second part of this chapter is aimed at tapping the intellectual capital of potential administrators and disaster managers through exercises aimed at tapping the creativity and intellectual grasp of first responders, administrators and disaster managers. Hence, we shall study in detail in this chapter only those hydrometeorological disasters that affect the most dense yet most vulnerable populations in India and the Indian subcontinent significantly. Having said that, there is hardly any hydrometeorological disaster that absents itself in the subcontinent. Hydrometeorological disasters leave not just a trail of destruction, but also their own set of consequential secondary calamities. For example, cyclones lead to floods, avalanches cause flash floods, floods and torrential rain cause cloud bursts, and so on. Many of these weather-related disasters unfold on account of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, a geological phenomenon when the Humboldt current in the South Pacific Ocean changes course once every few years from its normal anti-clockwise course to clockwise oscillation and this has repercussions on weather globe. On this particular map which will be put up here, uh, it's a NOAA map, an interactive map I think, you get an idea of the reverse directional movement of El Nino's current in the South Pacific. In the Southern Hemisphere, the normal course for oscillation is anti-clockwise move but during El Nino, the ocean currents traverse in the clockwise movement in the Southern Hemisphere, thus disturbing ocean currents, winds, fish migration rules, uh, ocean nutrients, all of which have a spiral 
thrilling effect on global weather. Less resilient countries and communities suffer more during El Nino. We will learn about El Nino a little later in this chapter. Hydrometeorological disasters or HM disasters cover about 85 to 90 percent of the total natural disasters in India and also account for 70 to 80 percent of the property and financial losses and also cause environmental damage. Disaster risk reduction has become part of sustainable development agenda. For example, uh, earthquake safe architecture, soil testing is a basic requirement in areas that are vulnerable to hydrometeorological disasters which is hardly any, any land which is not covered by hydrology. A major hydrometeorological disaster temporarily arrests development efforts. Thus, preparedness, early warning systems, disaster relief and disaster mitigation efforts of the disaster management agents ought to remain focused on hydrometeorological disasters which occur all the year round. The Congress has, this is a, a particular international seminar from which I'm quoting the report from, of which the report I'm quoting now. The Congress has focused on hydrometeorological disasters in four themes, namely floods, cyclones, drought and climate change in which keynote addresses and research contributions were presented by 65 speakers in different thematic sessions held on three days of the Congress. All the four themes covered under hydrometeorological disasters are multidisciplinary in nature and the success of societal applications would critically depend upon integrating the efforts of multidisciplinary agency. Knowledge gaps in different themes were identified and all embedded in thematic recommendations according to Second India Disaster Management Congress held on held between the 4th November 2009. The Link of which is going to be put up here. During the Kosi floods of August 2008, there were 527 deaths, 19,323 livestock perished, 220,000 houses were damaged, 3.3 million persons were affected. In the 1996 cyclone in Andhra Pradesh, 1,000 people died, 5,80,000 houses destroyed, rupees 20.626 billion rupees was the estimated economic damage. The 1990 cyclone in Andhra Pradesh took a toll of 967 people, 435,000 acres of land was affected. The 1987 drought in India left 300 million people affected in 15 Indian states. The 1977 cyclone of Andhra Pradesh accounted for 10,000 deaths, hundreds of thousands homeless, 40,000 cattle deaths. The 1972 drought in large part of the country affected at least 200 million people, affecting food security in India. It led to the government of India seeking food imports from the US. PL 480 was a resolution. The wheat exports to India under resolution PL 480 was notorious for exporting invasive weeds called parthenium that took decades to deweed out of the subcontinent. 31st October 1876, a cyclone with a storm surge of 12.2 meters or 40 feet hit Meghna River in Bihar. Uh, in the estuary near Chittagong in uh, Bangladesh, Barisal and Naukhali. Casualty figures about 200,000 people. The storm also caused epidemic and famine and vast property damage according to a Wikipedia link which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below. Annually about 120 million people are exposed to tropical cyclone has killed 250,000 people from 9 to the year 2000. According to coastal systems and low-lying areas assessment report the link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below. Uh, that was the quotation. I Further a database of disasters compiled by the United Nations Office for International Disaster Risk Reduction reveals that between 1980 to 2011, there were 3,455 floods, 2,689 storms, 470 droughts, and around 395 recorded extreme temperature variation. This, uh, these statistics were found on this link, on the UNISDR link, which I'm, I will put up here as well as in the description box below. In India, of the 7,516 kilometer long coastline, close to 5,700 kilometers is prone to cyclones and tsunamis, and and over 40 million hectares or 12% of the land is prone to floods and river erosion. According to, according to the National Disaster Management Authority, the link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below. Given the importance of saving lives, livelihoods and livestock from hydrometeorological calamities on the economy, this chapter assumes critical significance to planners and administrators in the subcontinent. 
Mapping India in Disaster Vulnerable Analysis from the web page of India's National Disaster Management Authority, it emerges that the Himalayas are prone to climate change and consequences thereof for the entire subcontinent. Glacial melt, flash flood, epidemics and earth. The Indo-Gangetic Plain is highly vulnerable to flooding and flash floods. The coastal belt in the peninsula is vulnerable to cyclones, storms, storm surge, coastal incursions, tsunamis and floods. Large parts of central India are prone to drought and desertification. This mapping helps us understand the demographic profile of vulnerability to various hues of hydrometeorological disasters. Now let's go to avalanche. Avalanche per se or avalanches per se do not affect very high population densities as mountainous areas in the subcontinent are relatively thinly populated. However, the impact of avalanches can have deleterious and cumulative impact on denser populations downstream. Avalanche is a snowstorm caused by slip of snow mass that hurtles down mountain slopes at tremendous. Although wide depth avalanches can be triggered by seismic factors, seismic pressure or glacial melt, even the slightest increase in temperatures that say sunrise can usher in mountainous area can trigger avalanche. Avalanche prone areas are highly sensitive to climate change. Further downstream, avalanches can cause flash floods of perennial river systems. In India, millions of people from the farming community are vulnerable to flash floods. Flash floods cause ruin of agricultural farm produce, torsion in international agricultural trade, tax, subsidies, insurance, short term flood inflation, ruin of soil strata and nourishment. Food insecurity of farming communities, eco-detrimental resilience efforts are counterproductive. Measures like fossil fuel based farm produce production, fertilizers and marketing initiatives etc. rebound and exacerbate climate change leading to increased climate change induced hydrometeorological disasters. Seismicity and landslides can also induce avalanche. While the peak winter months of December to February in the Northern Hemisphere and July and August in the Southern Hemisphere are the most probable months of avalanches, often heavy snowfall have caused avalanches in March and September and even April and October in recent years respectively. Between the years 2012 and 14, two deadly avalanches in the Karakoram or the K2 mountain high mountain range and the Himalayas accounted for very high death tolls in avalanches in the month of April. Unseasonal snowfall can largely be contributed to climate change and sometimes there are seismic factors like thrust of tectonic plate, subduction, landslides or earthquakes that can trigger avalanche. Mountainous areas like the Himalayas, Hindu Kush, Alps, Karakoram or the K2, Andes, Rockies, Caucasus, Elbors Mountains, Pyrenees, Urals, etc. are avalanche hotspots. In the southern hemisphere, Chile and Andes is a hotspot for avalanches and large stretches of the Andes in South America are avalanche hotspots. The Southern Alps mountain range in New Zealand has also many avalanche hotspots. But it is in South Asia that the largest population density is vulnerable to the impact of avalanche. Although the mountain passes and avalanche hotspots themselves are sparsely populated, avalanches have a Doppler effect down. Flash floods are triggered in the Himachal Pradesh state of India, a combination of landslide and avalanche prone hill state. In South Asia, three avalanches have scarred the collective memory in recent years, bearing relevance to our study on disaster resilience in South Asia the most populous part of the planet. One was in February 2010 when 17 Indian Army trainees who endured the toughest conditions during training fell victim to the might of Mother Nature despite a accurate avalanche forecast. India's Defence Research and Development Organisation Snow and Avalanche Study Establishment had made an avalanche forecast for Gulmarg in February 2010. It led to speedy evacuation of the tourists and state government officers. Unfortunately, 17 Indian soldiers who were training for this very calamity succumbed to the might of Mother Nature. Ironic. Another one was in April 2012 when Pakistan lost 129 soldiers and 11 civilians to an avalanche on the world's highest battlefield on the Siachen Glacier. It prompted a rethink in the Pakistani army if conflict in such challenging environment ought to be invested upon in the first place. In April 2014, 25 Sherpas who are indigenous people of the Himalayas and Nepal and Sikkim 
uh, bore brunt of the disaster risk and succumbed to the avalanche on April 18, 2004. The incident led to a rethink of lack of livelihood resilience for the Sherpas, without whom mountaineering groups can hardly complete Mount Everest expedition. Sherpas reportedly earn up to $5,000 US a year against the national Nepalese salary of $700 per annum. The Sherpas or mountain guides and assistants were buried alive in the avalanche triggered by a block of ice that had fallen off a bulge at a height of around or less than 6,000 meters, not a great height for an avalanche occurring. The incident bespoke the danger from climate change and its impact on mountain dwelling communities and their livelihood. The incident literally brought home the issue of climate change to the doorstep of the hardworking and much loved very vulnerable Sherpa. Quote, the Sherpas, a mountain dwelling tribe in the Himalayas, are the foot soldiers of the mountaineering community for whose adrenaline adventures the Sherpas literally had to sacrifice life and limb in a tragic manifestation of climate change on the 18th of April 2014, near the Kumbu Ice Fall, our route to the summit of Mount Everest, unquote, said Hari Krishna, a disaster risk reduction specialist at MOD. Disaster resilience for the Sherpas would include insurance, alternate livelihood options, and a network that offers job security, adequate compensation, etc. For more on the Kumbu ice fall avalanche that killed the Sherpas, you may want to visit the particular Wikipedia link, which I'll put up here as well as in the description box below. Avalanches can be triggered by seismic as well as climate change. Seismic triggers destabilize the fragile topography and delicate ecology of the Indian Himalayas and therefore may have adverse impacts upon the frequency of landslides and thereby avalanche in these areas, says Dr. J.C. Kunial, scientist and team head at the Environment Assessment and Management Team at the GB Fund, Himalayan Institute of Himalayan Environment and Development, Himachal Unit, Mohal, Kulu, Himachal Pradesh. All fold mountains are subject to tectonic thrust. Hence, the danger of seismic triggers that induce avalanches are ever present in such areas of fold mountains like Himalayas, K2, Alps, Rockies, Andes, Southern Alps, etc., which are all avalanche hotspots. Uh, here's a link which offers an interesting slideshow of the fold mountains of the world. I'm going to put up this link here. When they cascade down at terrifying speeds and mass, avalanches have highly disastrous results downhill. Mountain dwelling grazing communities, indigenous people, mountaineers, tourists attracted by snowbound mountain ranges, scientists and in India military personnel are under a very heavy and direct threat of avalanche. Avalanches also trigger flash floods further down in the plains, putting millions of farmers in the subcontinent at great risk of livelihood and food insecurity. Vulnerable sections of population can suffer from the destruction of homes, livelihoods and food stock. Besides, soil nutrition is restored, impairing, impairing farm-based livelihoods in the near and long term. During the flash floods in Uttarakhand in June 2013, in India for instance, the livelihoods of vegetable growers and sellers, tea sellers, tea vendors, freelance tourist guides not under employment suffered the greatest impact of the disaster. Though I have written an article in the Interpress News Service about the impact of the Uttarakhand flash floods, which can be accessed on this IPS news link, which will be put up here as well as in the description box below. All links used in this chapter as well as all book reading chapters will be put up in the description box below the video. Quote, Avalanches are features with snow mass. On a mountain slope, avalanches happen to stabilize fresh snow cover from the angle of repo. Movement of snow accelerates with triggers of the slightest movement. Surface shed loads to regain equilibrium. That is essentially the mechanism of landslides or avalanches on snow-capped mountains. Landslide is a landmass movement because of gravity. Landslides happen because of triggers like precipitation during monsoons. But if the landmass is on a critical angle the triggers can be from seismic factors seismic pressure during the monsoons can cause disastrous landslides malpa landslide in uttarakhand in october 1991 happened because no studies had been undertaken about the landslide hazard in the area if a study had been undertaken no camp would have been set up there and the catastrophe would have been averted said dr rameshwar bali associate professor of geology center of advanced studies in geology lucknow university in an exclusive discussion with the author that is me on the 27th of May 2014 in Manali, Himachal Pradesh. The Mount St. Helen volcanic eruption on the 18th of May 1980 remains the largest recorded landslide. A whole mountain slide, sorry, a whole mountain side slipped on account of volcanic eruption. Avalanches are probably the greatest single cause of fatalities in Himalayan mountaineering and the avalanches is 
as well as the fatal accidents they cause have their own distinct character they range in size from harmless clouds to some of the largest known avalanches in the world many avalanches coming off these gigantic peaks have tremendous fall heights and in addition can entrain large amounts of snow on their descent this combination can produce masses of snow and ice which can run for very long distances making it very difficult or even impossible in some instances for safe camp place another factor in the large numbers of fatalities is the big number of mountaineers and native porters which have been employed by many expeditions to reach the summits of these giant peaks the risk from avalanches cannot help but increase with such large numbers of people exposed in avalanche terrain for the lengths of time required on those expeditions up to several months sometimes risk will logically usually increase with the difficulty and height of the peak says david m mcclung in the study avalanche fatalities in himalayan mountaineering now i'm going to go to an an anecdote according to the mcclung study the number of fatalities and accidents according to peak height have been tabulated with mount everest accounting for the highest number of fatalities the data in this study indicate that avalanches account for a high percentage of fatalities on the world's 10 highest and that the number of avalanche fatalities on these peaks is proportionately higher than on any other group of himalayan peak ward 1975 provided statistics on ranging from Everest 8,848 meters above sea level to Annapurna 8,091 meters above sea level for fatalities from all causes up to the first ascent. Both data indicate that 53% of the 64 known fatalities were caused by avalanche. Other causes of death were exhaustion, sequelae 23% unknown 8%, heart failure and pulmonary edema at 5%, cerebral vascular 3%, frostbite 3% and related cause 3% and enteric fever 2%. Avalanche fatalities on the world's highest peaks between 1895 to 1979, Everest 8848 meters to Nanda Devi 7816 meters. Range of peak in height number of fatalities are uh, Everest 34 fatalities, K2 2, Kanchan Junga 5, Lhotse 6, 0, Makulu 1, Dhavalagiri 17, Manaslu 17, Cho Oyu 4, Nanga Parvats 20, Annapurna 12, uh, there are certain unknown mountains or unnamed mountains of of which one has been uh, one fatality has been reported. Himal Chuli 3, Kung Yung Chish 2, Peak 29.3 and Nanda Devi 0. Where no entries appear, it means there were no recorded avalanche fatalities. The study states, Everest leaves the list with 34 avalanche fatalities, many of which are from the Kumbu Ice Fall, which has served as the approach to the peak for most expeditions. Of all these peaks, Nanga Parvat stands out, however, as the most savage mountain since at present there have been 20 successful summit climbers with 20 avalanche fatalities and 36 total fatalities for an average cost of 1.8 fatalities for each person reaching the summit. For the others, Dhavalagiri and Manaslu also have greater than 0.5 fatalities per summit climber, says the McClung study. Every year in European ski resorts and slopes, hundreds of people die or are grievously injured in avalanche. Southeast of France, Switzerland, Northern Italy and Austria are avalanche hazard areas, accounting for avalanche related mon mortalities and injuries. Avalanche strike even at the altitude of 4000 meters which is still close to habitations and do strike at higher altitudes where people occasionally go. There is a need for greater amount of investment in research, avalanche data collection, avalanche monitoring technology, avalanche gear and avalanche rescue equipment and machinery etc. A large part of the land space in our region is occupied by mountains and yet our countries don't know how to deal with mountain disasters. Most importantly when situation demands a greater regional cooperation Operation and data sharing is necessary. The only government institution in our country that analyzes and forecasts avalanches is reluctant to share its knowledge with public, says disaster risk reduction activist Hari Krishna in an e exclusive email interview given to me for this book. Best practices in disaster risk reduction. Rescue teams have an ideal window period of 30 minutes after the avalanche strike to rescue injured. Avalanche survivors say it is like being entombed in concrete bunkers. Search and rescue teams have to rely on heat-seeking thermal cameras, unmanned utility vehicles or drones, 
and sniffer dogs to search for survivors in avalanche. To mitigate the tempestuous impacts of avalanches, organizations like avalanche forecasting centers in Europe, America, and India resort to installing avalanche fences and barriers. Precipitation and snowfall forecasts are made by early warning agencies like Snow and Avalanche Study Establishment of the Defense Research and Development Organization of Ministry of Defense, Government of India. Uh, the link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below. Despite ardent attempts by me to elicit best practices in avalanche management and risk reduction over a period of 11 months, uh, the SASE scientists, that is the Snow and Avalanche Establishment Study for Establishment uh, of Government of India, the, their scientists refused to respond to me by email or call. However, Switzerland's Federal Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research, called SLF or WSL, was more responsive. The SLF's press officer, Dr. Martin Hegley, responded to my email query regarding sir, research material, best practice and disaster risk reduction, early warning and pictures. Uh, I quote from his interview, until scientists began to develop the first instruments to facilitate the risk-oriented planning of protective measures in the 1990s, natural hazards like avalanches, debris, flow, landslides, flooding, earthquakes, etc. were addressed simply by responding to events and eliminating the danger from specific locations. In collaboration with its partners at home and abroad, the SLF has been contributing substantially for many years to the risk-based management of natural hazards and promoting the adoption of a unified concept for assessing risks and planning protective measures against natural hazards. This concept is based on actual risks, in other words, on the probability of a dangerous event occurring and on the anticipated injury or damage to endangered persons and property. To an increasing extent, the risk concept regards the management of natural hazards from the overall perspective of all possible risks, including technical, ecological, economic, and social. The SLF has been publishing the National Avalanche Bulletin since 1945. It has been continuously refined and is widely regarded as the benchmark for warnings relating to natural hazards in the air. For more than 10 years, regional avalanche bulletins have also been appearing in the morning. The reporting format has now been revised and optimized for internet and smartphone users. The key changes are improved visualization, the omission of detailed descriptions for individual regions, and the introduction of bulletins covering all regions twice a day in four languages, including German, French, Italian, and English. The revised format has been adopted at the start of 2012-13 winter season, including frequently asked questions. Please see the FAQ site, says the SLF's homepage. The link of it is going to be put up here as well as in the box below. As regards avalanche forecasting, Switzerland is considered the most advanced. On an average, around 25 people are fatally trapped by avalanches in the Alps by vast right in research, maintenance, forecasting and disaster mitigation efforts in Switzerland. Switzerland's Federal Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research undertakes weekly avalanche forecast monitoring in the winter months starting a few days before in threatening conditions forecasts are intensified by calculating the possibilities of alpine slides thousands of individual pieces of intelligence are analyzed before an avalanche warning bulletin is released in institute and outside observers including alpine guides key instructors school teachers mom cable car operators report every morning by phone and other means of communication on every aspect of snow and weather related conditions from 52 strat sites. Similar information comes in on an exchange basis from Austria and it new newspapers, radio, television feature the institute's bulletins. They are also recorded by the Swiss Federal Telephone Service and are available to anyone who calls, says James Winchester in the article White Terror of the High Mountains in the Reader's Digest publication called The World Around Us. The Switzerland Federal Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research offers an interface research and application on its web website, the link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the box below. For avalanche protection, the institute offers supporting structures in starting zones, deflecting and catching dams, snow sheds, direct protection structures, example splitting wedges, supporting structures against snow gliding and snow fences to control wind transported snow, risk evaluation for highways and settlements including cost efficiency analysis for various combinations of protection measures, avalanche hazard map, consulting quality management expert advice for code, temporary preventive measures from artificial avalanche release by explosives to comprehensive safety concept, early warning avalanche forecasting are the primary mitigation measures for avalanche disasters. The trouble in India is the terrain that is vulnerable to avalanche very vast and albeit being sparsely populated avalanche avalanches have a multiplier effect on downstream communities that are vulnerable to flash floods and ruin of agricultural produce that puts their livelihoods too at risk 
livelihoods of not just farmers and tourism employees but people dependent on allied service sectors of these two sectors are also affected in refuge recovery takes years reiterating the need for resilience and livelihood security deforestation on the himalayan slopes is also adding to the soil inferred and can trigger landslide which at higher altitudes implies avalanche says dr kunial scientist and theme head at the environmental assessment and management team gb pan himalayan institute of himalayan environment and development at the himachal unit mohal kulu in himachal pradesh he says nature is supposed to meet everyone's need but not greed quoting mahatma gandhi keeping in mind the same we have to be sensitive to our activities in our surroundings so nature needs to be treated like a friend but not a foe holistic approach needs to be established between individuals and nature our very our every stakeholders need to be awakened about these day to day extreme climatic event we have to maximize our forest cover with the indigenous species in our respective areas preferably at the same time we should reduce our emissions in the atmosphere unquote a couple of interactive websites for avalanche risk and avalanche behavior are included for the benefit of the readers now conclusion effective early warning application of research effective disaster mitigation efforts with prevention of catastrophes and rapid response are the key to mitigating disasters caused by avalanche all this depends on efficient scientific infrastructure disaster preparedness infrastructure and commitment of scientific and rapid response personnel and that is all for tonight we have covered avalanches in depth tonight in the next week's video we will finish blizzards and then maybe one more essay uh, on that will be on the uh, 8th or 8th and 9th of uh, but on the 2nd of april uh, there will be no live interaction following this video only uh, the live interaction will come up only at the end of this chapter until next week's video take care keep smiling stay safe and stay home ciao but there's one more announcement i need to make last week that was on the 26th of march i wasn't able to put up the video because the internet had gone bust all the cables all the wires had snapped and unfortunately snl officers and their uh, vendors and service personnel did not attend to it for five days i was offline sorry but i may, i had last year that's what has come up today there are a lot of uh, links that i'm going to, going to be putting up below the video please feel free to check these out and interact take care keep smiling ciao